Um, but his focus areas include supporting increased wildlife connectivity as well as protecting the Santa Clara River and Utam, or Utam is a native a tribe, a tribe name for that river, and the species that reside in that Santa Clara River, Utam River watershed. Now, he also has done much with environmental justice. Uh, he practiced a uh, public interest land use law at a firm in Orange County where he successfully fought the expansion of an open air waste transfer facility in a low income neighborhood. So once again, our concerns are both for the world of nature and for the human humans in it. So here's J.P. Rose. Good morning all. Thanks for having me. Uh, so yes, my name is J.P. Rose. Let me just grab this little PowerPoint thing here. So yes, I'm with the Center for Biological Diversity. Um, I'm based in Los Angeles and focus mostly on fighting sprawl developments. Um, I use CEQA quite a bit in my everyday practice, so I'm very excited to share with you um, about one of the cases that I'm working on, um, kind of illustrate CEQA in action. Um, but before I do that, I just want to um, just make a quick comment about um, what some of the other presenters were saying about how CEQA, at least on paper, is a very powerful law. It has very lofty ideals, protecting the environment, um, even if it sometimes um, leads to maybe less economic growth, protecting the environment, public health, um, but that sometimes there is a, a mismatch between you know, the words in the statute and how it's actually enforced on the ground by agencies, often when there's developers, pressuring agencies to get a project approved. So that'll kind of be a theme in my presentation as well on how you as citizens can help ensure that CEQA is enforced and the environment and your local environment is protected. Um, okay, so here's just a quick roadmap of what I'm going to be talking about. Um, I'm going to talk about a project that I've been engaged in fighting called the Altair Development, um, and some of the species um, that are threatened by that project, including the Santa Ana Mountain Lions. I'm going to um, zero in on some of the CEQA issues with the project, how we raise them, and how we continue to raise them in the ongoing litigation. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about the city's responses to our comment letters and to other um, you know, comments and criticisms of the project before the approval of the project, and also finally um, talk about the litigation and next steps. <clears throat> um, well, what that slide has, uh, you'll see in a moment, is a picture of the uh, development sites. The project we're fighting is called the Altair Specific Plan. It's a 200-acre residential development um, next to Old Town Temecula. Um, the reason we got involved is because the southern end of the proposed development um, would develop a very important wildlife corridor. Um, that wildlife corridor is also recognized in the local habitat conservation plan, the Western Riverside County Multiple Species Habitat Conservation Plan, which is known as the MSHCP. And so um, that southern area, which you can see um, just at the very bottom of the diagram, is uh, very important for local mountain lions. Um, that migrate or move from the Santa Ana mountain ranges to the west into the eastern peninsula ranges to the east. So just a, a little bit of background on the Santa Ana mountain lions uh, because they're so important to the story and to the sequel violations at issue in this case. Um, Santa Ana mountain lions are one of the most imperiled mountain lion populations in uh, the United States. They have the lowest genetic diversity of any um, mountain lion population studied in California. Um, and scientists have suggested that they may go extinct in the next few decades um, because of the lack of genetic diversity, the lack of connectivity with other populations. Um, in addition, they, they struggle from um, secondary poisoning from herbicides, from vehicle strikes, and also from legal depredation kills where you know, if it attacks like a pet goat, then um, someone can get a legal permit to kill a mountain lion. So these, this uh, population is doing very poorly um, due to freeways, sprawl, just blocking its ability to move and disperse. Um, here's just a graphic illustration of that. You can see uh, kind of in the center of the picture, the Santa Ana Mountains, and um, then you can see the I-15 snaking down from um, north to south 
and that's a, a massive barrier to movement between the Santa Ana Mountains and the Eastern Peninsula Ranges to the east, and also obviously the San Bernardino Mountains as well. And uh, this is just a very uh, uh, kind of visual illustration of the, the health problems facing this population of lions. Um, due to the significant inbreeding that is taking place because they are unable to um, cross these freeways, there, um, there's often um, birth defects in the lines, such as king tails that you can see here, um, very emblematic of the, the declining genetic health. So um, that diagram of the uh, development I showed you earlier with that south parcel area, which I mentioned was the important wildlife corridor, this is just a photo of it that I took um, a while back. And you can see it's, it's, it's a very kind of lush river corridor, lots of documented use by mountain lions, and it's one of the, the last viable places for them to cross from the Santa Ana Mountains to the Eastern Peninsula Ranges. So with that in mind, it's just a little bit of background. Um, let's talk about some of the CEQA violations um, and how you can um, kind of use this information in your own communities. Um, so under CEQA, this was talked about a little bit, I think, by Tim earlier, but I'm going to get into a little bit more detail. Um, CEQA has what are known as thresholds of significance, um, where you have to have like a mandatory finding of significance that certain things occur. And um, under the CEQA guidelines, which is a very, it's a great resource to look at, it's used by the agencies, but also by citizens groups, um, one of the um, thresholds of significance is if uh, a project has the potential to cause a wildlife population to drop below self-sustaining levels or threat to eliminate a plant or animal community. And then there's that third one about restricting the range of an endangered, rare, or threatened species. Now, um, mountain lions aren't currently listed as a rare or endangered or threatened species, so we weren't able to rely upon that, but I'll talk a little bit more about that later. We were, however, to say that this project has the potential to um, eliminate this population by blocking connectivity needed for it to um, persist. And to make this argument, you obviously would want to uh, rely upon experts. And we were fortunate that there were a lot of esteemed mountain lion experts who were um, informing the agency here in the city of Temecula that the project would have the potential to harm the Santa Ana mountain lions. Um, on, this, on the uh, screen is just the last page of a letter by two of the most prominent mountain lion experts in the West. And um, they, they said it was their scientific opinion that this project would substantially harm the population by impeding, um, <laughs> impeding the uh, movement of mountain lion between the two ranges. And it wasn't just the mountain lion experts, we also had California Department of Fish and Wildlife is very concerned about this project. Um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and obviously um, conservation groups like the center um, raise this issue in comments as well. Um, and, and this was uh, talked about a little bit, but just to kind of apply the law to the facts, so to speak. Um, CEQA, you know, it doesn't prohibit projects that have significant impacts. Um, but one of the arguments that we made here, both before project approval and now during the litigation, is that the EIR has to disclose in detail and in, it has to essentially paint a clear picture of the adverse impacts. It can't down, it can't kind of you know minimize them. It has to explain them in detail, um, give the nature and magnitude. Um, and I'm quoting from a recent California Supreme Court case. Sierra Club versus County of Fresno, which really drove that point home. Um, and so, you know, once an agency finds that an impact is significant, it triggers that mitigation obligation. CEQA has a substantive mandate. You have to mitigate impacts to the extent feasible. So obviously what we're arguing here is that A, the EIR isn't um, describing the impacts and acknowledging that they're going to be significant and harm this, the Santa Ana mountain lines, and B, um, the lead agency needs to consider alternatives and mitigation measures to actually deal with those impacts, such as you know, pulling the development out of the wildlife corridor. Um, and then just kind of another uh, side to that, another way you can argue the same issue, and we did here and continue to do so, is um, under those CEQA guidelines, which again are an invaluable resource, there's a threshold of significance for whether the project would 
interfere substantially with the movement of any native resident or migratory fish or wildlife species with established native resident or migratory wildlife corridors. And here, there was overwhelming evidence that the project would do exactly that. Um, it doesn't matter if an outline isn't listed as an endangered species, it's going to block the, um, the movement of the species, and that's a significant impact that needs mitigation under CEQA. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit more in a bit about um, kind of the city's response to our comments about the mountain line issue. But before I do that, I want to talk about one of the other major CEQA violations related to the case, um, which I think would, will, will be kind of informative for your own advocacy. Um, and so just to get a little more into the weeds again, um, CEQA requires that the impact on a special status species can be significant if it substantially restricts the number or restricts the range of the species. Um, and um, as Tim was saying earlier, even the killing or take of one of these species can be considered a significant impact under CEQA. And um, because it's a significant impact, it needs mitigation, but it also needs to be studied in the EIR. Um, so here we have the western pond turtle, which is considered a special status species by the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Special status is, um, it, it's not quite as high protection as threatened or endangered, but it's still um, a status that means something under CEQA. So if there's special status species that um, may be impacted by a project, that could trigger a finding of significance. At a bare minimum, what you're supposed to do under CEQA is um, study the existing conditions. Um, do surveys to see if there are special status or endangered species at the site because without you know, looking into whether they're actually there, you can't um, disclose the impacts or propose mitigation. So the problem here was that the city of Temecula, along with the developer, were saying, oh, there are no western pond turtles in the area of the project site. Even though it was well-known western pond turtle habitat, it was right by their breeding grounds, it was right by three streams that they use, they said, oh, we don't even have to look for them because um, there's a steep slope, and they can't go up steep slopes. Um, so here we had a problem where they were essentially uh, failing to study the baseline conditions, the existing environmental conditions. And um, what we did, along with the wildlife agencies and other conservation groups, was um, present studies showing that actually the western pond turtle can very often go up steep slopes with no problem. And so for the city to say, because there's a steep slope, there's going to be no pond turtles is simply false. Um, so that, that was something we raised repeatedly in our comments and are continuing to raise in our litigation. And um, just to kind of really illustrate the type of um, quote-unquote analysis that cities will use, unfortunately, sometimes. Um, so here, here you have kind of their section on the western pond turtle. This is a quote from the EIR for the project. Um, so it says, you know, they're known to use upland areas. Um, it says there's steep terrain, and then because there's steep terrain, they're not going to be in the area, basically. Um, and this is kind of a, a good example of the type of conclusory and um, essentially meaningless uh, and misleading analysis that, unfortunately, you will find in EIR sometimes. <clears throat> and it highlights, again, the problem, the mismatch between the ideals of CEQA and how it was carried out on the ground. Um, with agencies, and often, you know, this, for example, was written not by the city planner, but by, you know, the developer's consultant, who, you know, is under immense pressure to produce analysis that, you know, is favorable to the developer. So obviously, you push back on this, you send scientific studies to the agency, you make the administrative record um, to show that the agency simply got it wrong. So, um, yeah, I think th this talks a little bit about what I just said, but um, th there was actually like a program by one of the local agencies, the RCA, where they had actually monitored turtles using these steep slopes. So again, um, plenty of evidence that they used the slopes and that the EIR simply got it wrong by saying there were no pond turtles in the area. So I'm going to talk about one other um, major CEQA violation with the case. Um, and then talk a little bit more about the city's responses and how we dealt with that. Um, so, as I mentioned, there's this kind of, there's the Western Riverside County Multiple Species Habitat Conservation Plan. I know that's a mouthful, it goes by MSHP over there. 
Um, I, I, over here, there's the Coachella Valley MSHCP, which is a very similar idea. Um, many of you may be familiar with that, but um, as Brendan was mentioning in his presentation, the idea behind these um, MSHCPs is to provide tape coverage for endangered or threatened species um, in exchange for um, you know land being uh, protected and also certain conservation goals being implemented on a project level. Um, and you know under CEQA, the way that it works under CEQA is that you can't directly enforce the MSHCP with CEQA, but what you can do with CEQA is say, hey, did the environmental document adequately disclose whether the project is consistent with the HCP? Did the environmental document um, show how all the HCP's requirements were actually met for this project? Um, and that, that's kind of a mandatory requirement under CEQA that it include that discussion. So here we argue that the EIR did not do a good job of describing the project's consistency with the MSHCP. And I'm going to get into a little bit more detail with that. <clears throat> um, and another reason, to, just to kind of highlight why this is important under CEQA, is that there's a threshold of significance in those Appendix G guidelines that says, does the project conflict with the provisions of an adopted habitat conservation plan, natural community conservation plan, or other regional or other approved local regional or habitat conservation plan? So again, the idea here is you can sort of indirectly enforce the existing habitat conservation plan for an area through CEQA by uh, holding the agency accountable to disclose how the project complies with the HCP or habitat conservation plan. Um, and here, I'm going to get not really too deep in the weeds because it's specific to that MSHCP, but essentially what the problem there was is that under the Riverside MSHCP, there's certain um, acreage or conservation targets for certain um, blocks of acres under the plan, and the uh, Altair development has simply failed to follow any of those requirements and said they were just voluntary and not um, mandatory. Um, a position that was you know, not based upon the text of the HCP and vigorously disputed by the wildlife agencies who actually hold the MSHCP. So you know, they, they adopted this flawed position on the MSHCP um, at the um, behest of the attorneys for the developer. Um, and you know, we're, we're in litigation about that now, I won't go into more detail, but it kind of highlights how you can have these great conservation plans where they can have good goals, but then on the ground, when the project is proposed, is the lead agency actually um, ensuring that the goals in that conservation plan are being complied with? And unfortunately, sometimes the answer is no, especially if there are um, concerned citizens actually holding the agency accountable. Um, I think I, I went over this a little bit just now, but the, the gist of this slide is that U.S. Fish and Wildlife, Cal Department of Fish and Wildlife, explained the violations to the, um, explained how the plan was not um, complied with for the Altair project, and the city decided that, well, we have our interpretation, you have ours, we're right, we're going to approve the project anyway, which is uh, part of the reason we're in litigation over this right now. Uh, And um, yeah, here's just a little bit more about the city's responses. Um, so when we first got involved, um, we got involved during the draft EIR section, or the kind of phase of the sequel process, which Tim talked a little bit about. And um, we, we documented or went into great detail about all these violations of CEQA, violations of the MSHCP, failure to um, describe the impacts and outlines. And what the city did was say, well, hey, we won't build a college or hospital on the wildlife corridor. Instead, we'll build a nature center, which will be much smaller. Um, so while well, that was you know, a step in the right direction, they were still going to be building in a wildlife corridor, um, which you know, is, is still not acceptable from our perspective. Um, and they also, interestingly, in one of the hearings, they tried to get me um, on the record to waive the center's right to bring any action um, if they you know, did this nature center, cultural center thing. So that was interesting. Um, but So it's just kind of how cities operate, or city council members in some jurisdictions operate sometimes. But um, the other thing that was interesting that kind of shows how much goes on behind the scenes is 
The other local agency that enforces the permit, the Western Riverside County Regional Conservation Authority, initially found the project inconsistent with the MSHDP, but on the eve of project approval after an intense lobbying campaign by the city, they issued a letter reversing that determination, while the wildlife agencies still found the project inconsistent. So um, that kind of highlights how much pressure, you know, cities, developers can exert um, in order to get the results that they want, even if there are plans or laws in place to prohibit such things. <clears throat> Another interesting thing, and I hope I don't see this type of conduct ever again by an agency, but I probably will, <laughs> is um, so the development agreements um, for this project, and actually let me back up for a second. Um, a development agreement, for those of you who don't know, is essentially like a contract between the local city or lead agency and the developer kind of establishing the like rights and responsibilities of each party for like a project. Um, and so, <clears throat> so in this case, what the city did in order to try to discourage any um, lawsuits by citizens groups was say, hey, we're going to build this less intense nature center in the wildlife corridor, but if a CEQA lawsuit is filed after the project is approved, we are going to have the right to convert it into a far more intensive hospital or college use. Um, and that was a way of them trying to tell the conservation community, go, um, you know, don't, don't file suit. If you do, we're going to um, harm the environment even more. And obviously, we took issue with that um, because that violates CEQA's um, you know, public participation rules. It's a contract on contrary public policy under California law. Violates the First Amendment of all laws. So unfortunately, though, despite all that, cities will still do stuff like that. And I just have a quote there from one of the council members explaining his reasoning of um, why he's going to basically, uh, if environmental groups sue, then he wants to be able to do a far more intensive use. So unfortunately, this is the type of thing we deal with sometimes, and I'm sure you do as well. Um, and that's just kind of the excerpt from the development agreement saying, you know, if legal action is filed, we have the right to switch to a far more intense use in our sole and absolute discretion. So the other fun thing they stuck in the development agreement to try to discourage uh, citizens, organizations from um, enforcing CEQA was um, they were going to set aside $500,000 um, allegedly for voluntary conservation mitigation. Obviously, it wasn't voluntary. It was required under CEQA. But what they said was if um, a CEQA lawsuit is filed, then most of that money is going to go away, and we're not going to um, use that money for conservation. Um, and so we obviously argued that was um, illegal, and they actually removed that from the final development agreements, um, which was you know, a step in the right direction. But again, unfortunate that cities and developers are playing these sorts of games. So um, the project was approved in December 2018, um, which commenced the 30-day statute of limitations. As some of you know, once a project's EIR is approved, there's very little time to actually file a lawsuit. Um, and, you know, I haven't been doing, well, I guess I've been doing this for about seven years, but what I've noticed is that agencies will often approve controversial projects over the holidays. Um, I don't know if that's on purpose, maybe it is, but, um, you know, and then you have 30 days to file suit, get a lawyer, and, you know, try to, try to keep challenging the project. Um, but we, so we filed suits in, January 2018, along with our allies, Sierra Club, Mountain Lions Foundation, and Kuru Connection. And um, I can just walk you through a couple of the claims, the lead claims in the case, um, which are somewhat similar to what I mentioned earlier. So one of the main things, again, failure to accurately disclose and mitigate impacts on the Santa Ana Mountain Lions. Um, again, the CEQA guidelines are clear that if you're going to harm a population of animals, even if they're not listed as endangered or threatened, you have to accurately disclose and mitigate those impacts. Uh, second major claim, failure to disclose inconsistency with the Western Riverside County MSHCP. Again, we can't enforce that plan directly, only the wildlife agencies can, but you can still um, indirectly enforce it through CEQA. And, um, the final thing, which, you know, actually, I take back what I said a second ago, one way you can somewhat enforce it directly is if the agency has that HCP incorporated to their general plan. 
because under California law, you can, um, there are, there's a way to sue for um, a city approving a project that is inconsistent with its general plan. And so uh, what we did here is say, um, this project is inconsistent with the general plan for the city of Temecula because the general plan incorporates the MSHCP. Um, and there are policies in the city general plan that say we're going to follow the HCP, we're going to coordinate with the wildlife agencies, and here we have pretty strong evidence that they didn't do that. Um, and so you can kind of directly attack um, an HCP violation that way. Um, that being said, though, general plan challenges are very difficult because of the amount of discretion that courts give um, cities in interpreting their general plans. Um, but it's still an important argument to make. So that's just a brief over uh, overview of the lawsuit. Um, something else, um, just to kind of highlight the theme that seems to be running through these presentations of the mismatch between the ideals and the um, implementation of CEQA is um, we discovered nine months after the lawsuit was filed, which I guess was just um, about nine months from now. Well, it was, let me see. Well, in any event, we discovered during the litigation that the city of Temecula had a policy of destroying all emails after 30 days unless the staff member separately saved the email in some kind of separate pile. So that's a big problem for a couple reasons. Um, a, under SQL, you're supposed to preserve the administrative record, which is just a fancy term of all the documents related to the project. And under SQL, the statute is very clear that that includes internal agency communications, such as emails. So an agency can't just decide, well, we have our own little policy of deleting all that, and that's what we're going to do. In addition, the government code has very specific laws about maintaining records for at least two years. And um, under um, kind of general litigation law, for lack of a better term, um, there's this thing called the duty to preserve evidence in anticipation of litigation. Um, and so if a, you know, a party or an agency or a person is informed that there is a substantial likelihood of litigation, they have a duty to suspend any document destruction policies that they might have in place to preserve that evidence. So once we found out that the city had been destroying records, we amended our lawsuit to include a separate cause of action under both CEQA and the government code alleging um, improper destruction of records. Um, and you know, the reason, one of the reasons this is important, well, let me just get to the next slide. I'll talk more about it. So uh, it, what we did, however, like a year or so before the litigation was filed, we sent them what's known as litigation hold um, language. And what that essentially, as I mentioned a moment ago, is kind of a formal notice to an agency saying, hey, we hope you're going to comply with CEQA, but if you're not and we're forced to file a lawsuit, um, you're hereby informed now that you need to suspend your document destruction policies and preserve all evidence. So we did that over a year before we filed suit. Um, they ignored that and kept destroying records anyway. Um, and now, you know, they're going to have to see the judge about that at the trial in a couple weeks. Um, but I think the takeaway from that is that um, it's a good idea to conclude language like this. I think I have a picture. Let's see. Actually, I think it's from my afternoon slides. But what I will say here is that it's a good idea to include um, litigation hold language in your comment letter. And you can have the, the slides and kind of just copy and paste if you'd like. Because that will, you know, if an agency does have a policy like this of destroying records, it will be on notice that it can't continue doing that. Because um, unfortunately, this happens more often than than it should. It also doesn't hurt to ask an agency for its document retention policy, because often what they'll do is have this archaic policy of destroying everything that's you know inconsistent with state law. But you know if you ask for it.